Welcome to Spiritual Calisthenics. Christ is in our midst. Today on Friday, October 13th, we commemorate Saints Carpus, Populus, Agathodorus, and Agathonica, the martyrs of Pergamus, Saint Benjamin the deacon, Saint Chrysi, the new martyr of Greece, Saint Meletius of Pegas, patriarch of Alexandria, Saint Florentius, the martyr of Thessalonica, and the higher martyr, Jacob of Hamadura. Regarding Saints Carpus, Populus, Agathodorus, and Agathonica, Saint Carpus was bishop of the church of Theatira in Asia Minor, and Populus was his deacon, whom he had ordained. Seized as Christians and tormented in Theatira, they were taken to Sardis, whither Agathodorus, their servant, followed them, and also confessed Christ, and was tormented with them. Together with Agathonica, the sister of St. Populus, they were all beheaded during the reign of Decius in the year 250. Your martyrs, O Lord, in their courageous contest for you, received as the prize the crowns of incorruption and life from you, our mortal God. For since they possessed your strength, they cast down the tyrants, and wholly destroyed the demon's strength as presumption. O Christ God, by their prayer, save our souls, since you are merciful. To those on earth our sovereign master has granted your sacred relics as a most precious treasure, and as a fountain pouring forth great streams of for cures. For they purge away the ills of the manifold passions, and bestow upon our souls grace divine without ceasing. Wherefore with one accord we keep your feast with fervent longing, O Carpus and Populus. Regarding the holy new martyr, Chrissi of Meglin. Encrisi, the new virgin martyr and undefiled bride of the heavenly king, Christ God, was from the village of Slatina, of the district of Meglin, lies near the border of Serbia in Bulgaria. She was of a poor family, being one of four daughters, yet she was rich in acquired and natural virtues. In acquired virtues, that is to say, by her fervent faith in God, and by her virginity and prudence, and natural virtues by her comeliness. And beauty for which also the Blessed One was deemed worthy of being perfected by a glorious and noble martyrdom. There was a certain Turk there who, seeing her beauty and comeliness, was pierced in the heart by satanic love for her, and kept watch to find an appropriate time to accomplish the evil purpose which he had conceived. One day the saint came out with other women to gather wood. When the Hagarin, that plotter against the saint's virginity, learned of this, he took some other Turks with him also, and going there seized her and carried her off by force to his house. At first he began to flatter the saint with many promises, tempting in this manner to pervert her convictions and lead her to his religion. He told her that if she accepted and became Muslim, he would take her as his wife. At the same time he began to threaten her also, saying that if she were not convinced by his words, he would submit her to great tortures. But yet when she was truly but when she who was truly golden, both in mind and in name, you see means golden, heard these things so unexpectedly, she did not fear at all, but in her heart she called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to come to her aid. With great nobility and boldness she answered, I believe and worship my Christ, and him alone do I have as my bridegroom, whom I shall never deny, even though you inflict ten thousand torches upon me, even though you cut my body into small pieces. When they heard these things, they understood that they alone would not be able to convince her. For this cause they used other means. Wherefore, knowing that women are more adept than men in deceiving others, especially other women, they gave the saint over to their women, and commanded them to use every means and device to convince her. When they had taken the martyr, what did they did not do? What they did they not devise? What magic spells did they not use against the virgin? For nearly six months they incited for the Blessed One to accept the religion, but in vain did they labor, for the Blessed Christie was firmly established upon the immovable rock of the faith in Christ. Afterwards, they called the martyr's own parents and sisters, and with great threats commanded them to incite their daughter to become Muslim, or else she would be put to death, and they would be tortured and would suffer great loss. Therefore, when the parents and sisters of the martyr drew near to her, her fear constrained them to do this, though unwillingly. They said and did all those things which are able to soften even the hardest and most adamant soul. And they wept and cried and said, O sweetest daughter, have pity on yourself and on us, your parents and your sisters, who are all in danger of being destroyed on your account. Deny Christ just for the sake of appearances, so that both you and we might be delivered. Christ is compassionate and will forgive you this sin because of the necessity and violence. And here... Let each one consider how vehement and how great was this warfare, which the devil had devised and set in motion against the martyr. 
What thoughts of weakness and sympathy could have overcome the tender virgin from the rivers of tears which her mother and her father and sisters shed in her presence? But take courage, beloved, the power of Christ conquered even this warfare and device of the devil. For being aflame with the heartfelt fire of love for Christ, you see, who was manly and mighty in soul, was not at all inclined to sympathy by words and tears of her parents and sisters, as nature demanded. Rather, like one above flesh and blood, and beyond the laws and limits of nature, she turned and spoke to these praiseworthy, most wise words to her parents and sisters. You, who incite me to deny Christ, the true God, are no longer my parents and sisters, nor do I wish to have you as such henceforth. But in your stead, I have my Lord Jesus Christ as Father, my Lady the Theotokos as Mother, and the saints as my brothers and sisters. With this answer she turned them away. Well done to your stoutward courage, O saint. Well done to your true love for Christ. Well done to your wise convictions worthy of heavenly praise. Truly, brethren, in this saint there is fulfilled that which the divine David said, My father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord hath taken me to himself. And that which the Lord said, I am come to set a man of variance against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. When the Muslims, and especially that evil lover of the Virgin, saw that they could achieve nothing, nor pervert the saint from the faith of Christ, even with those means and instruments which they had conceived, they abandoned flatteries and words from that time forward and began torturing the martyr. At first, for three whole months, they beat her daily with clubs. Later, they skinned her, took many strips from her flesh, and left them hanging in front of her, so that she might be stricken with fear at the sight of them. The blood ran like a river from the virginal blood of the martyr and her body, and the nearby earth was reddened. Afterwards they heated a skewer and passed it directly through the ears of the martyr, so that smoke came forth from her nose and mouth. While suffering such numerous and such grievous tortures, which would humble even the most stout-hearted of men, the martyr of Christ endured with great nobility, being strengthened by the power of the cross and by her heartfelt love for Christ. For Simeon Metaphrasti states, the soul that is held by the bonds of love for God deems suffering as nothing, rather it reveals in pain and prospers in adversity. When the saint heard that there was nearby the priest Timothy, the abbot of the august monastery of Sarvanikita on Mount Athos, a man modest and trustworthy, whom she had as her spiritual father, who also narrated her martyrdom, she sent word to him by a certain Christian that he makes supplication unto God, that she may be accounted worthy to finish the course of her martyrdom in a manner pleasing to God. Finally, not being satisfied with the numerous torments which they had inflicted upon the saints, but rather marveling how she remained yet alive and did not die, those cruel and hard-hearted ones, nay, one should say rather those crueler than the wild beasts themselves, could not endure the fact that they had all been conquered by a maiden, and they became so angry and obstinate, well, what does not evil devise? that they hung the Lamb of Christ upon a wild pear tree, and all ran at her with their knives and cut the sacred body of the Virgin to pieces. This took place on October 13, 1795. In this manner was the good Chrissy tested and made radiant by such numerous tortures, like gold in a furnace. She surrendered her holy soul into the hands of her immortal bridegroom and received a double crown as virgin and as an athlete. And now... She dances and rejoices together with the prudent prize-winning virgins in the heavenly bridal chambers, and stands at the right hand of the bridegroom Christ, and reigns together with him unto the ages of ages. As for her victorious and virginal relics, certain Christians took them secretly and buried them with honor and reverence. By her intercessions may we also be counted worthy of the kingdom of heaven. In the Greek Zenexade she is known as Chrysi, while in Slavic she is known by the more popular Zlata, both however mean golden. From St. Paul's Letter to the Philippians Brethren, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you stand firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear omen to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict which you saw, now here to be mine. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, 
any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Do nothing from selfishness and conce or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. So this is a high call that St. Paul is doing here, and it is important because these are instructions that are only able to be given to people that are a little bit more spiritually accomplished than what we see in the letters to the Corinthians or the Thessalonians, uh, because how are you able to accomplish such great things where St. Paul is telling them, be eager and excited to suffer as I suffer, to walk the path that I walk in complete agreement, to look at other people as better than yourselves. That's hard. First, you have to crush the ego to do that. The Philippians have the ability to do that. Let us pray that we also gain that ability. From the Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, the twelve disciples came to Jesus and said to him, Send the crowds away to go into the villages and country roundabout to lodge and get provisions. We are here in a lonely place. They said to them, You give them something to eat. This is iconic, as we see within the feeding of the 5,000, that Christ is telling the church, the apostles, to feed the people. He said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we were to go and buy food for all the people. But there were about 5,000 men. He said to his disciples, make them sit down in companies, about 50 each. And they did so, and made them all sit down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were satisfied. So again, we see the disciples are the ones bringing the food to the people, just as the priest and the bishop and the deacons are the ones that bring communion to the people. And all ate and were satisfied. Meaning that it wasn't just little crumbs. It wasn't just little uh, pieces of the bread and fish. They ate enough to be full to be satisfied, and there's still leftover. That, meaning that the church, the fullness of, of the church, is able to satiate the soul and the body, but there's still more. The church is so much greater than that. And they took up what was left over, 12 baskets of broken pieces. 12 meaning the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, symbolizing the church itself, that the baskets are full of the fragments, that nothing is left, nothing is wasted that the greatness of the church is still there and able to be given to us when we are ready to receive it. Now it happened that he was praying alone. The disciples were with him. This is something that we see that Jesus Christ does. After every great miracle, he goes away and prays by himself, showing us how we are to be. We're supposed to be active in our ministry and then retreat to ourselves and pray in secret. I hope that you've enjoyed today's spiritual calisthenics. Have a blessed and wonderful day.